waiting for my cue. Good evening, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be with you this evening. Uh, my name is Audrey Coleman, and I'm the director of the Dole Institute. And this is our fall 2022 installment of our counselor series. And we are so excited that we've got a full house here. Um, you all are very special people, because not only did you brave the rain, but you chose to be here instead of watching Jayhawk basketball. So I feel like uh, maybe we should hand out prizes or, or put, some, put, put something under your chairs. but. Um, we know that you know that this program is going to be fantastic and well worth your while. So uh, we're so pleased to see you uh, and welcome our friends back to the Dole Institute, Mr. Ed Duckers, who's a partner at Stoll Reeves and head of the firm's litigation practice, and Pedro Aragongaray, attorney and partner at Aragongaray Attorney and Revenaw. So thank you, gentlemen, for joining us, and I'll let you all introduce your witnesses in just a few moments. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Counselor Series, this is a, a, an event, a series that uh, is inspired by uh, courtroom mock trial or, um, or and a cross between a, the trial and a debate. So this will be, format will be a little bit different and our moderator, Student Advisory Board Coordinator, Catherine Magana will explain to us the ground rules in just a moment. Um, tonight's topic that we'll be discussing is resolved Felons should be allowed to vote after completing their sentence. Uh, this being uh, on, the, on the heels of an election earlier this week, this is a topical uh, discussion uh, as we think about who votes and who doesn't and who might like to vote should they uh, have the access to the vote uh, itself. Um, before I get started, I want to be sure and mention that we had a wonderful Veterans Gala this past Sunday. The, uh, decorations that you see around here uh, are in honor of our veterans. Uh, tomorrow is Veterans Day, uh, and we're pleased to honor our servicemen and women uh, with the gala. And uh, also an event coming up next Tuesday afternoon, uh, November 15th at 2 p.m. here at the Dole Institute, we will host author Erica Cornelia Smith, who will discuss her book, Service Above Self, Women, Veterans, and American Politics. So please plan to join us here at the Dole Institute or online or on YouTube later on. Uh, we kindly ask everyone to please silence your cell phones. And I think I've, oh, I have one more um, message here. I want to be sure and note to tell you that the counselor series is made possible through a grant from the Koch Family Foundation. All right, Catherine, whoops, and skipped out there. Catherine, are you ready for this? I know, you, I know you are. <laughs> All right, take it away. Thank you, Audrey. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, it's so great to see you all and to be moderating this evening's event. And I'll now tell you a bit of the ground rules and explain what's going to happen tonight. So each counselor will present to you their case, making opening and closing arguments and be supported by their two expert witnesses. And we have our counselors, Mr. Duckers and Mr. Iganagarai. And the rules are simple. Each side will present their case and must follow the time constraints for each set of arguments and cross-examination of their witnesses. We have our timekeepers here on both sides, and they will be holding up cards to let each side know how long time they have left in their case. Each side will have five minutes for their opening statements, 24 minutes to ask their witnesses questions to build their case, and they will have 16 minutes in total to cross-examine the opposing side's expert witnesses. They may choose to split this time up however they would like, and the timekeepers will continuously let them know how much time they have left. Each side will also have five minutes for their closing statements. Counselors, when your time is up, please conclude your speech in a timely manner. The Counselor Series is consistent with the mission of the Dole Institute of Politics, to promote political participation and civil discourse in a bipartisan, balanced manner. Now, without further ado, we will begin the program. I welcome Mr. Iragana Garai from the Affirmative to make his opening statements. Council, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. And thank you for being here and for those of you that are observing this program vis-a-vis -vis the internet. In my opening statement, I wish to introduce my two witnesses so that their testimony will not be taken by 
an introduction. I have two superb witnesses in the order in which they will present. First is Mr. Neil Volz, the gentleman on the uh, far to your right on my table. Uh, Neil is the deputy director of the Florida Rights Reservation Restoration Coalition. He helped lead the efforts to pass a valid initiative in Florida that ended a lifetime ban on voting for 1.4 million people in, uh, in that state with prior felony convictions. The passage of Amendment 4 was the largest expansion of American democracy in a generation. His previous work includes being chief of staff as a member of Congress uh, and the staff director for full congressional committee. While in Washington, Vols helped uh, negotiate and secure passage for the Help America Vote Act, which spent billions of dollars improving voting accessibility and accuracy for millions of people. He's a former guest lecturer at the U.S. Naval Academy. He was named the top hired gun in the Hill newspaper annual list of top lobbyists. He will be my first witness. My second witness, Emmy Fettig, is a civil and human rights lawyer and leading expert on criminal justice reform who has garnered national recognition for her work on prison conditions. She is currently the executive director of the Sentencing Project, a national research and advocacy organization to end mass incarceration and promote racial justice. The Sentencing Project has conducted research on voting rights Bans for Justice Involve People for over two decades and publishes the only national 50 state census on the numbers of people disenfranchised by felony convictions in our country. The Sentencing Project provides research and technical support for state and local groups working to expand voting rights for all justice involved people. Prior to joining the Sentencing Project, Fedick served as Deputy Director for the ACLU's National Prison Project, where she litigated constitutional claims on behalf of incarcerated people. A national expert on prisoner rights and criminal justice reform, Fedick has also provided technical assistance and advice <coughs> to advocates around the country and has served as an adjunct professor of law at Georgetown University Law Center School, where she's taught courses on public interest advocacy and the, at the University of Michigan Law School, where she taught a course in law of incarceration. I could go on and on about these two individuals. We are fortunate that they're here. The question of whether or not an individual who's committed a felony after they complete their sentence is not whether or not it is permissible under the Constitution. It is permissible. The 14th Amendment allows states to do so. The question is, is it morally correct? Is it morally correct to punish someone forever for a prior error, or to punish them by denying them the right to vote once they've completed their sentence and probation? I suggest the answer is no, and there's no moral excuse to do so. The disproportionate number of individuals being denied that right are African Americans and people that are poor. Thank you for your attention. I know you will enjoy both presentations. Thank you, Mr. Aragonagarai. Mr. Duckers? Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Aragonagarai, ladies and gentlemen of the audience and around the world. 
College campus seems like a really good place to ask this question. After he's indicted, and after he's convicted, and after he's served his sentence, should Donald Trump be allowed to vote? Anybody? Show of hands over here. <laughs> Your Honor, I win. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. <laughs> Donald Trump makes an important point, and the important point is not whether they could find the right shade of orange in the jumpsuit to match his complexion and hair, but he makes a point about how we ought to approach this issue that we'll be addressing tonight. We will be presenting to you two themes. Mr. Aragonagarai is right. To some extent, this is a moral question, and it is, is it too harsh a punishment to deny voting rights to those who have violated the social contract by committing a felony. Going back to Hobbes and Locke and their very influential social contract philosophy, the proposition is very simple. Those who break the laws should not be allowed to make the laws. And that is precisely what we do when we allow felons to vote either directly for the law on referendums and propositions or indirectly for representatives. It is a concept as old as the ancient Greeks, and it's one that is founded in justice. And one of the things I will be asking you to remember is the victims of crime. We're going to hear a lot from the other side about the criminals as if they are victims, but we're going to be talking a fair amount about the victims themselves and the harm that's inflicted by people who commit felonies. The second theme that we'll be exploring is simply this, and this goes back to the Trump example. To the extent we are inclined to restore voting rights for felons, that should be done on a case-by-case -case basis after a period of time in which we can judge the likelihood of recidivism <clears throat> and based on the individual facts of individual cases. We know that two-thirds of felons will commit another crime within three years. So if we restore voting rights two-thirds of the time, we are going to be wrong. <laughs> So we want to do this in a more targeted fashion. And how we think about this issue depends a great deal on who we're talking about. If we're talking about someone in their 20s who made a single mistake, it might seem quite reasonable to deny them voting, to restore their voting rights after they've rehabilitated and gotten an education. On the other hand, if we're talking about Timothy McVeigh's accomplice or the Unabomber, or those sedacious conspiracy thugs from the Oath Keepers, or God forbid, Rudy Giuliani, it might not seem all that reasonable to ever restore their voting rights for the crimes that they committed. We will present to you two experts who will cover these two topics. The first is Professor Stephen McAllister, who is the ES and Tom W. Hampton Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of Kansas. Steve specializes in con law and Supreme Court history. His resume is frankly amazing. Prior to joining the KU Law School staff in 1993, he clerked for Judge Richard Posner of the Seventh Circuit, easily the most influential appellate court judge of the last 25 years. Followed that up by clerking for Supreme Court Justice Byron White and then for Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. He left after his clerkships and joined the, one of the preeminent Supreme Court and appellate practices in Washington, D.C. at Gibson Dunn before returning to the University of Kansas and the law school in 1993. He has received awards too meritous to mention. He served as the Solicitor of Kansas and the Solicitor, of General, Solicitor General of Kansas. He's been the Dean of the Law School. He's been the Acting Executive Director of this institution. And most recently, he was the U.S. Attorney for the District of Kansas. Our other witness, professor, Dr. Michael Smith, is, the, is a professor of political science and the chairman of the social sciences department at Emporia State University. He has done extensive research and scholarship on voting laws and civic engagement, and he will be discussing with you how this issue should be addressed, not only from a societal perspective, but from the best interests of the people whose voting rights might be restored. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Duckers. We will now hear from the affirmative's first witness.
Would you please introduce yourself? Uh, hello, can you hear me? We're good, okay. Uh, yeah, my name is Neil Voles. Uh, I am the deputy director of the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition, and I am a returning citizen. Uh, that's what we call ourselves, those of us who actually have past felony convictions. Um, would you please answer the following question? Do you believe when a person's debt is paid to society, is it paid? In many states, like driving with a suspended license, marijuana possession, trespassing on a construction site are felonies. Should part of a person's debt to society be that they lose the right to vote because of their conviction? Uh, one, I appreciate the question. I appreciate the opportunity to have this conversation. Um, I love the format. And um, I, I come at this a little bit from the perspective of spending a good portion of the last decade of my life fighting to restore voting rights for people in the state of Florida. Uh, we found ourselves in a spot in which there were 1.4 million people who were uh, facing uh, or ineligible to vote um, because of a past conviction. So that's about the size of the, the population of New Hampshire. Uh, so that we're talking about systems here uh, that, that, that work in a way that have a dramatic impact in our society. So as much as it's interesting to talk about specific cases uh, that can actually have a distorting impact sometimes on a conversation. Um, but, but, but like you had said, there, there are some basic values at work here and, and we saw that play out in communities all across the state of Florida uh, during our effort to not only get uh, Amendment 4 on the ballot by getting a million 100,000 people to sign petitions in support of it, but to then get it passed by two-thirds of the voters in the state of Florida on a bipartisan basis. And, and the core value underlying that entire effort was just this basic premise that when a debt's paid, it's paid. Um, what we found was that that wasn't something we needed to convince anybody of, that actually that's pretty deep, deeply ingrained in all of us. Everybody sitting here, for the most part, all, whether somebody grew up in church or doesn't even know what it's like to be in church, whether they come from a different faith tradition, across the board there was a common value that we all could rally behind and, and that helped move not only the, 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 the progress that we've seen in Florida, but if you see all across the country that there is a groundswell of support for this concept concept of when a debt's paid, it's paid. It's, it's deeply embedded in us as human beings. And so that was, that, that, that's definitely something that I believe very strongly in. Um, and I think that's important to kind of keep that in mind uh, as we debate this, uh, that all across the, the political spectrum, all across geography, all across the divisions that we emphasize and we see a lot of uh, when, we, when we have our, 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 our discussions about politics, uh, that, that deeper than that is, is a real basic human value that says, hey, when a debt's paid, it's paid. And uh, so definitely believe that. And, and in terms of kind of, you know, understanding the process that we're talking about here, so 95% of the people who are incarcerated will come home, right? They will be in our communities with us, um, and, and everybody has an incentive to make sure that that works. Um, and what we've seen is, is that large numbers of people also get convictions. Uh, I'm gonna be a little Florida focused, y'all, so sorry about that, but I, you know, I, I know we can, we can bring out st uh, statistics from recent studies in Stanford, University of Michigan, University of Minnesota, a variety of information. I'm, I'm more well versed in, in, in the Florida piece. Um, and, and what we know in Florida is, is that 75% of the people who get felony convictions actually don't get a prison sentence. Right, so what we're doing in the vast majority of cases is actually telling somebody who we don't even think that they've done something so bad that they should go to prison, that they should never have a voice in their society again. And so I think that uh, when we look at this from the perspective of the systems at work and, and, and how big of an issue this is, um, you know, it, it, it just reinforces those, those values and those morals that you're talking about. Um, I will say one thing. Right, uh, as I was, I was listening and having some cool conversations with the students here earlier, is that I remember what it was like to vote for the first time after losing my rights uh, to vote. Um, it was super emotional experience, right? I, I've been doing this work for years. I didn't anticipate that suddenly I'd be like hugging and crying people you know, with, with, I didn't even know, you know, and really kind of engaging in what felt like a super sacred act, like, like and, and, and it hit me. 
um, that in that moment, right, right around that same time period, it was, it was in August of 2020 during the primary in, in Florida, that I just met a woman named Barbara uh, who had never been able to vote. Um, and her story spread across our whole team and our whole movement very quickly because when she got registered to vote, she, she started crying and she said she had been told she only had three months to live. And all she wanted to do was make it to the, the ballot box. Right? She didn't say she wanted to meet a, a rock star. She didn't want to go to Disney World. She didn't want to have you know, some trip. She wanted to vote because she had never voted before. I wish this story had like a super happy ending, but she died before election day. And her sister brought her ashes with her in to go vote. And after the election, we got to go with the, the supervisor elections and get her a posthumous award, a voting certificate that is in her house right now with her kids. And so I think that's important to remember what we're talking about here. This isn't casual, you know, this is, this is very foundational to what, what you learn about in this building, what, what Senator Dole's life was dedicated to, is this, this concept of self-government, that, that this isn't some sort of casual conversation, but that deep, deep down, there are real values and morals that we, we use us to, that we use to guide our lives. And so I'm looking forward to the, the conversation. Uh, you get this Irishman going, man, I'm just going to keep talking. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to read your body language, and I'm going to shut up right now and uh, turn it over to the more, more esteemed witness here. Um, I have one more question okay. for you. According to a study by the Florida Parole Commission, people with convictions who have had their voting and civil rights restored were three times less likely to reoffend than those who did not have their rights restored. Isn't more citizen participation in the community and less, it, excuse me, isn't it more citizen participation in the community and less crime good for everyone? Uh, yeah, right, right on. Um, I, there, there was a, a, a long-standing study done by the Florida Parole Commission. So this is the government, this is law enforcement in the state of Florida who did a multi-year uh, study on people who had their rights restored. And what they found was pretty astounding, uh, and that is that the people are three times less likely to reoffend after they've had their rights restored. Um, I know there have been, and I, I mentioned some of the other studies, the Stanford study, the University of Minnesota study, the Michigan study. It's hard to do a, a complete cause and effect when, when we're talking about something like that. But what I've seen uh, in, 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 in my time in the last decade working with, with folks like myself who have past convictions is that the vote symbolizes something. Like it, it, it symbolizes in you that you're a citizen, that you are a part of the community, that you can move forward and reintegrate uh, with, your, with your life and, 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 and engage in, in things like anybody else. This, this concept that when the debt's paid, it's paid actually can then be seen in your own life in which your, 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 your voice matters and, and you can take that past mistakes, those, 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 uh, that pain that you've been through and, and, and create purpose. Um, and it becomes a very powerful impact, you know, to the point where when you start talking about people being three times less likely to reoffend, like that's amazing virtuous cycle there. One, you've got somebody who feels a part of the community. Two, you have less crime, right? So you actually have less a need to, to pay for law enforcement, to pay money into the courts and spend the time and the pain and, and, to, and to see, right, because we do have challenging recidivism rates, like our systems don't necess aren't necessarily set up to set people up to fully reintegrate into the community. Um, but those 95% of the people who are coming out, right, when you are able to see yourself as a full member of the community, uh, you actually reintegrate better, and that ultimately is better for everybody. And I would say that that's been one of the most eye-opening things for me as I walk, go across the country and all across Florida. And I love to be on a college campus here because I think subversiveness is a really good thing. And I want to plant a subversive seed with y'all. There are things that can be done that are win-win. Right, that you can create solutions that are not just good for red or not just good for blue, not just good for one person in this geography or th that person in the other geography. You, there are actually solutions in which everybody can benefit. This is one of them. 
when somebody gets a job, when somebody sees themselves as a member of the community, when somebody's able to reintegrate, it's not just them that benefits. It's the local business community. It's law enforcement. It's, it's the culture around them. It's their families. And this is an integral part of that process. So I would, beyond the debate that we're having, I would encourage y'all who we grow up on our phones and we see this divisiveness just coming right at us, this idea that it's zero sum in every d discussion that we have. What what I've been taught and what I've seen in the real people's lives is that you can create solutions in which we can actually have a better society for everybody. And this issue is one of those issues. We have two minutes. You indicated that you had your rights restored. Would you briefly tell us about that process and what it has meant to you? Um, yeah, I got a felony conviction in 2006. Uh, I got a fraud charge. Um, made some stupid, ultimately super selfish decisions. Um, I crossed some lines I shouldn't have crossed and got caught. Um, created a lot of pain um, in my community, in my family, um, blew up my life. Um, and in the process, I, I, I began to kind of <laughs> live, live a new life, right? You got a label at that point, right? The label that I get to check every time I tried to find a job or when you try and get health care, when you try and get you know, a, a loan when you try and get housing. Um, and I began to see this issue a little bit deeper, right? I began to see that what we're actually talking about is how we do life with each other. How do we see each other? You know, what does it mean when we, you know, encapsulate somebody in, in a picture of the worst thing that they've ever done and say, hey, you know what? I'm legally allowed to hate you because of that moment. I can deny you housing. I can deny all these things. Um, it changed my life and, and gave me new, new purpose and meaning. Um, but it, it culminated when I got involved in the movement to restore voting rights in Florida. Um, began in 2015. Uh, we ended up collecting over a million petitions. Um, it was it was so empowering, man. Like it was really really cool to watch um, what people can do, right? Because the, the, what was amazing about this movement was is that elected officials and politicians had promised to make these changes forever. But the systemic problem was there was no a voter who could hold them accountable to that, right? So when push came to shove, this always got shoved, right? So all of a sudden you had real pain in the community, loved ones, family members who were like, man, what are we going to do? And uh, Desmond, our, 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 the leader of this movement, had this crazy idea that, like, what if we, what if we get some petitions and we get a P.O. box? Like, listen to this, y'all. A P.O. box in Clearwater, and we got a bunch of petitions. The first 80,000 petitions got signed. There was no money. There was no organized interest pushing this thing. It was love of family members who said, I, I will help my loved one. And that is what led to this movement that ultimately um, restored the ability to vote for 1.4 million people, people, including myself. And so when I was able to reach into that ballot box and vote for the first time, I got to see it from the lens of a long, a long story that got me there. So thank you for the Thank you, Neil. <clears throat> Timekeepers, how much time does Mr. Eric Onagrai have oh, no. left? Get back down. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm crossing right now? Yeah, you do get crossing Ooh. right now. Yeah. Really quick, timekeepers, how much time does the AF have left? 11, 12, okay, all right. Mr. Duckers. Thank you, Mr. Volz, you were just talking about pain. I wanna, get, I wanna ask you a question. Felon goes into a liquor store, robs it, pistol whips the, older, the elderly owner of the liquor store within an inch of his life. Um, he suffers, he's in a coma, he suffers permanent brain damage. Felon goes to prison, felon gets out of prison. First of all, does the victim suffer pain as a result of that crime, sir? You bet. And does that pain end when the felon's prison sentence ends? So you, you mean, I mean, the, the, there's a does certain the amount of pain. the pain of the victim who's mentally damaged as a result of being pistol whipped mm -hmm. end when the perpetrator is released from prison? Or is that something he has to live with for a lifetime, sir? I, I presume on some level they have to live with it for a lifetime. All right. Now, you were talking about repaying a debt to society, so let's talk about this hypothetical criminal, okay? Mm -hmm. Robs the liquor store, pistol whips the owner. He, when convicted, is going to face, in all likelihood, a prison term, correct? Right. He's, likely, he's very likely to owe fines, restitutions, and maybe court costs as a part of repaying his debt to society, correct? Mm -hmm. He will forfeit his right to serve on a jury, correct, permanently? Depending on what state they live on, and yeah. Yeah, 
He'll forfeit his uh, right to hold public office permanently in many states and mm -hmm. federally, correct? Mm -hmm. And he will also forfeit his constitutional right to own a gun that's protected by the Second Amendment of the Constitution, correct? That's the current interpretation of the last there's, court. There's yeah. actually federal statutes that say that, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And most states have statutes that permanently prohibit gun ownership by convicted felons, correct? Mm -hmm. All right. And then in addition to all of that, as a part of repaying his debt to society, he will forfeit his right to further participate in our representative democracy by voting, correct? What, I mean, what, what you have is... Now, would you answer my question, Mr. Yeah, Bolts? Yeah, On top I, of all of these other items of punishment and repayment, we have the felon's loss of voting rights, correct? There are certain states that's not true. That's what I was trying to get oh, at. Yeah. Is you're you're and, asking and, me and, to say and, yes or no, and, and, and it's just a little bit more and, complicated and a, than in that. In a state that, that has felon, a felon right, There are states that you never lose your right to vote. Right. Yeah, and there's some where you would, correct? Right. Yeah. All right. And it is only that last piece of the debt that is being paid, repaid to society that you object to, correct? I know. I think people should get their guns right, gun rights back. I think sh they should be fully empowered citizens. Well, that's interesting because I have read everything on your organization, Mr. Foles, mm -hmm. and I've never seen a single word out of the FRC advocating for the restoration of gun rights to felons. Not one word. Can you point this audience to anything that has ever been said by you or your organization that says you support giving gun rights back to felons. Yeah, if anybody has their phone on right now, they can Google the name Senator Keith Perry, the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition, my name, and you can see how we talked in the media, a very public venue, and we supported and worked with him to get a bill introduced that would restore gun rights to people with past convictions. All right. <laughs> now, you talked about uh, paying a debt to society, repaying a debt to society, correct, Mr. Foltz? Yes, sir. And you acknowledged just a moment ago that a part of the debt to society, repaying the debt to society, is fines, restitution, and court costs, correct? Your organization is now fighting against the governor of Florida who is requiring, under Amendment 4, felons to have fulfilled their obligation to pay fines and court costs and restitution, correct? Yeah, our, our organization, which helped lead the effort, right, to get Amendment 4 passed, believed that the punitive part of somebody's sentence, including their fines, including restitution, should be paid. Um, what we got was an argument about whether any money should be paid or no money should be paid. So if you look, if you dig a little bit deeper into kind of where we're coming from, it's the cha we, we, we see the challenges of partisanship. So we, even on our website for the passage of Amendment 4, we said you need to pay your restitution. Um, fines become something that we wanted to dig into a little bit further. But, but because of the way the court system is funded in Florida, it. it's funded he by fees and costs. That, that became something that we, we, we uh, wanted to uh, look at a little bit differently. So I can, I'm sure you can appreciate the nuance in which I'm talking about. Well, the about. nuance I appreciate is that it not, you, are not, you are not in favor, at least on the sentence part, of people repaying their, completely repaying their debts before they're given the right to vote. We, we, we want anything that's associated with the punitive, at the, the, what the judge gives you that you should have to pay back. Okay. But the cost of doing business, the, hey, it's, it cost me $150 just to walk in the courtroom. That's, that's a cost. That's not a part okay. of your punishment. So, all right. Fair enough. Amendment 4 does not restore voting rights to all felons, does it? No. Your organization assisted in drafting Amendment 4 and mm -hmm. promoting uh, Amendment 4 and supporting Amendment 4, mm -hmm. correct? Yep. And Amendment 4 does not return voting rights to, f to murderers and people who are guilty of violent sexual crimes, correct? Correct. So you saw fit when you were putting your statute together, Amendment 4, to decide there are certain felons who are so heinous they should not have their voting rights restored, correct? Yeah, we... That's all, it's a yes or no question. <laughs> now the next question is, you also, you decided when you were making that decision that treason, people who perpetrate f treason, people who engage in voter intimidation, people who engage in racial hate crimes, uh, the guy who pistol whipped the, the, the elderly owner of the liquor store, all of those people, you decided their crime was not so heinous 
uh, that their vote should not be returned to them, correct? Treason, we, 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 we allowed Treason, the public sir. to tell us what, where the lines were drawn. So it was a political oh, act. It was a political act. So you drew a line where you thought you could get enough votes to pass Amendment 4. Correct. That's really noble. Now, let me ask you this. In your state, under Amendment 4, we're going to go back to our liquor store owner who got pistol whipped within an inch of his life. And let's assume there's a second one who doesn't get that inch and he dies. Under your approach to, to criminal justice reform, the felon in the second instance never gets his voting rights, but the felon in the first instance does because he was saved by, by an inch. Doesn't that seem somewhat arbitrary to you, sir? Yeah, well, the, the language in the, in the Constitutional Amendment is very clear. It says murder, and, and I'm, I'm kind of the old Scalia, you know, like attempted murder isn't murder, manslaughter is not murder, murder is murder. So what the Constitution says is drives what the decision making so is. So let's, let's, go, let's go back to our example, okay? The reason the, the first elderly gentleman su survived is because of the skill of his neurosurgeon, which the second gentleman didn't have. Is the skill of a neurosurgeon a reasoned principal basis on which to decide whether to restore someone's voting rights? The reason <laughs> to, to restore somebody's voting rights is that they've completed their sentence as given to them by a judge and the state attorneys and the people who know the totality of their case and said, this is what the punishment you have to pay in order to cross this breach that you've had with the community, and when you're done with that, you're done with that. Right, but they haven't repaid their debt to society if society has decided your debt includes giving up rights to serve on a jury, full public office, own a gun, or vote, correct? That debt's never repaid. Can you ask that question again? I mean, now, whatever the judge time, gives you, I'm, right? I'm going to run yeah. out of time because I really want to get to this Florida study that you talked about. May I approach, Your Honor? Uh, you may. This is the Florida study you're talking about, right? 2011 study of uh, recidivism among people who were granted the right to vote in 2009 and 2010. This is part of the study, yeah. All right. And if you could turn to page six of the study, the first thing I want to identify is that there was a very selective process mm -hmm. in place in Florida in 2009 and 2010 for who was granted the right to vote, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. There, were th there were three tiers. Lesser felonies automatically got it. Medium felonies, there had to be an investigation and decision made um, and without a hearing, and then greater felonies, mm -hmm. investigation, but it required a hearing, correct? Mm -hmm. So what you had in this study that showed recidivism was lower was a very select group of people that were identified as, have, as being unlikely to be recidivists, correct? I, I don't know that I could go that far. Y yeah, you, you're correct. They, they, they picked who was in the universe that they studied. That's right. And then they compared it to six or seven prior years to all felons, including the ones that were most likely to be recidivists, correct? I, I, I <laughs> you're, you're summarizing some things. I, I'm, I'm tracking with you. Okay. Yeah. So you would agree with me. We're, we're comparing apples to hammers here, right? We have a select group of people, of felons, who've been given the right to vote back on the one hand, and we have all felons on the other hand. And as you sit here today, you cannot opine as to whether or not that difference in the pool accounts for the entire difference in recidivism rates. You simply don't know, right? Oh, yeah, as I said, it, it's hard to make a cause and effect uh, analysis well, on it, this kind it of thing. it didn't seem to be hard for you to make a cause and effect analysis on your direct testimony when you told us that restoring voting rights will, will reduce recidivism by three quarters. In fact, you have no evidence to support that, certainly not out of this Florida There's study. clearly a correlation that there were people who had felony convictions who had their civil rights restored, and in comparison, they, they were less likely to reoffend. A, a select pool was less likely. Now, you would agree with me, too. I need to save some time here. You would agree with me, too, that the longer period of time you measure, the higher the recidivism rate is going to be, correct? Well, it's interesting because you, you talk about like the three-year studies. A actually, what most studies will show that once somebody's out for five years, they're actually less likely to be harmed to the community than somebody who's never served time. Right, so, but from one to five, it goes up, correct? Recidivism rates go up. Uh, it's hard for me to say that. Well, um, you know the DOJ study that says 
50% of felons are going to be re- arrested within a year, 66 within three years, 75% within right. five years. Yeah, but correct? I think even with that point, like you have an, a jump right out of the gate, right? When a lot of people, what, what uh, happens is you get handed $50 in a bus pass, you have no social network, and they're like, hey, good luck finding a job, finding housing, and we need you I don't, to I don't stay out of trouble. I disagree with that. Right? I just want to deal with the stats. Okay. It's clearly... Recidivism happens fast, which yep. is why we shouldn't immediately restore voting rights to people who are just going to commit other crimes, correct? Right. Well, a lot of people will be on probation and things like that before they complete their sentence or they oath, so they're not getting them restored but, immediately. But you would agree that the total, although the rate declines, the total number of people increases over time. Oh, the, the number yeah. of people will yeah. increase over right. time, sure. And this study that you touted in your direct testimony, that covered less than two years of time and was compared to statistics that were collected over six years. Correct? Something like that. That's fair. Right. And that, and the entire difference could be attributable just to that difference in time, right? Mm, no. Oh, really? Well, let me show you. Have you looked at, the, at some of the, at, you know, the, Florida does this study every year. Mm-hmm. You know that, right? Yeah, it's different now. Yeah. Right? Cause, Have you looked cause at the 2016 right study? I'm going to show you this because one of the things that Florida does is it looks back at, 20, at the people you're talking about mm-hmm. who got voting rights in 2009 and 2010 and it calculates their recidivism percentage as of 2016, five years later. Mm -hmm. Why don't you take a look at that and tell me what that recidivism rate is? As a reminder, you have four minutes left for cross-examination, right? I'm having too much fun. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) So I haven't really had a chance to kind of Well, it's right there. It's highlighted in the box. No, no, I get it. I'm not saying I don't trust you, but I also, you know, like... um, It's 27%, isn't it? Which is almost exactly the same as the 33% for all felons in the six-year study, which tells you that you got no or no material recidivism improvement out of those people whose voting rights were returned in 2009 and 2010, doesn't it, Mr. Bolts? Uh, I I don't read it that way. I think if you look back, if you look into 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016, you also see the the impact of the clemency board policies on these outcomes, which is a variable that I don't think we should discount. I'm just talking about 2009 and 2010. Yeah, I understand. You're, 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 you were telling me that I was comparing apples to hammers. I think you're doing a little bit of apples to hammers well, now, as well. Well, the policy changed in uh, 2013, 14, 15, and 16. But the policy became- changed in 2011 is the one well, that is relevant. Right. The policy change to become much more restrictive and recidivism rates went down. I'm talking about the period of time you chose to emphasize, and it's 27.2%. Okay. That's fair. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Counselor. How much time does the negative have left for cross-examination? One minute 34. One minute 34. All right. Thank you. We will now hear from the affirmative's second witness. Thank you, Mr. Fold. Thanks. Eleven twelve then. Eleven eleven minutes twelve seconds. Yeah, correct. Right. Miss Fedek, good evening. Good evening. It's nice to be here. It's nice to have you here. Uh, Ms. Fedek, what is the scope of voting right bans for people with a felony record in the United States? Well, quite extensive in the United States. Forty eight of our fifty states have some form of of voting ban for people with a felony record. Could you bring the microphone a little closer to you? I sure can, is that better? Yes. Uh, I'm a lot shorter than Neil, so I had to adjust a little bit. So we have 48 of our 50 states have some form of felony voting ban on the books. Many of these laws date back to the post-Civil War period when the ex-slavers attempted and successfully did undermine the black vote in the South. Others of these laws are of more recent vintage, but the effort to suppress the vote and to suppress the vote of certain groups in our society is very much the same. Now, my organization, along with the University of Minnesota, the University of Georgia, and Hamlin University, do a census to find out just how extensive 
these voting rights bans are in our country. And we've done that for over two decades. And what we found just recently in the, 20, the 2022 midterm elections, just Tuesday, is that there are today, and this is a very conservative estimate, 4.6 million Americans who are denied the right to vote because of a felony conviction. That's one in every 50 American citizens does not have the right to vote. Three out of four of these Americans who are denied the right to vote live in the community. And I want to point out that this, the extensiveness, this undermining of citizens' voting rights is an outlier. It is an outlier globally, and it is an outlier in our history as a dem democratic country. And the reason that is, is because in the last 50 years, we've experienced something called mass incarceration in this country. It's unprecedented, the number of people that we put behind bars. You may have heard that uh, oft-quoted statistic. We have fewer than 5% of the world's population, but we have over 20% of the people who are locked in prisons and jails. Over the last 50 years, we've become not the land of the free, but the land of lock them up and throw away the key. That now means not only do we have more people than anybody else locked up any, at any other time in our history, but we have more Americans who have felony convictions on their records. 8% nationally of American adults who, are, who should be voters are have felony records. In some states, it's as much as 15% of the population has a felony record. Can you imagine what that does for voting power of certain groups in our society? Can you imagine what it does to the voice of so many of our fellow Americans who get left out of our democracy because of mass incarceration? It makes us a global outlier. We used to be the leader of the free world. We were the first democratic nation on this planet. And today, our sister democracies, the European countries, they don't disenfranchise like we do. If, the, if disenfranchisement exists, it's very narrow, and it's generally focused on people who have committed voting rights violations. Some of our closest allies and our closest friends, like Canada, Ireland, Sweden, Spain, they never disenfranchise because they value the democratic voting rights of their citizens so highly. So we are an outlier globally. And what this means is that so many of our people can't vote and can never vote. But I don't want to sound like a too much of a downer, because there is hope. Americans recognize that our democracy as, is at risk. And over the last 10 years, although we peaked in 2016 at 6.1 million Americans who were denied the right to vote because of a felony conviction, that number has actually decreased 24%. And from 2020, the last time we did the census in my office, to 2022, I actually have some very good news. And that is we found in, in 2020's election, 5.2 million Americans were disenfranchised. And today it's 4.6. Now part of that reason is because the COVID numbers of people in prison went down. Larger part of, of, of that decrease is because eight states since 2020 passed laws to expand the franchise for people in the community. Recognizing that our democracy is, is at risk, that we have gone too far, that we have denied the vote, that very most basic fundamental right of all Americans since the founding of this institution, we're getting better. States are passing laws to expand the vote, and I think that that gives me hope, and it gives millions of Americans hope that someday soon, their voice is gonna count, count again, as it should. This next question 
deals somewhat with some of the comments you made in your initial response. But it's nonetheless, uh, I think, important. Are some groups disproportionately impacted by voting rights bans for people with a felony record in the United States? There's no question that that's the case. Mass incarceration has not impacted all Americans the same. If you are a poor person, if you are a person of color, especially if you are an African American, if you are disabled, if you have a mental health issue, you are going to be much more impacted by mass incarceration. You are going to be much more likely to have a felony conviction. Uh, and in fact, I, I agree with a defendant's uh, expert Professor Michael Smith in his most recent 2020 book about voting rights, uh, that felony disenfranchisement has in particular disenfranchised African Americans. And another result has been uh, that it has given Republicans an advantage. So you have both not uh, race-based outcomes of felony disenfranchisement and also viewpoint discrimination. Both of those things should disqualify felony disenfranchisement under our Constitution. Uh, but I will also say that there's a larger issue here. What, what are the numbers? One in 19 African Americans who are of voting age are disenfranchised in this country. African Americans are 3.5 times more likely to be disenfranchised than their non-African American counterparts in this country. Uh, there's no question that the black voice in our community that should be there, that should be contributing to our country and our democracy has been left out, blocked out, locked out because of felony disenfranchisement. This raises hugely serious questions about the power, the nature, and the legitimacy of, the demo of our democracy in this country. It doesn't make sense if you believe that one person equals one vote. And isn't that the fundamental premise upon which this country was founded, on which all democracies are founded? But I also want to uh, address another issue about felony disenfranchisement that my colleague Neil, Neil Volz brought up. And that's the fact that felony disenfranchisement is unequivocally bad for public safety. It does not help public safety. The studies that are out there are very rigorous and they have found that People with a felony conviction in the community, those who vote are less likely to be arrested, they're less likely to be convicted, and they are less likely to report criminal activity than individuals who don't vote. We also know, based on an, the most rigorous recidivism study done by the Bureau of Justice Statistics, which covered over 300,000 people and existed, and the minimum participation is three years, that states that have permanent disenfranchisement compared to states that actually allow people to get their voting rights back, well, they have at least 10% higher recidivism rates. That 10% counts. That 10% undermines public safety. And if we are engaging in mass incarceration for the purpose of public safety, which is, that's what we're told, then why on earth would we ever implement laws and policies that undermine public safety, especially when it also undermines our democracy? We have to start paying more attention to our voting rights, and we have to care as much about the voting rights of our neighbors and our, our fellow citizens as we do about our own. What we have in this country now, the crisis in, this, of, in our democracy, it is self-inflicted self-inflicted wounds, but we don't have to continue to do this. We can expand our voting rights. In fact, that's the only way we can save our democracy because frankly, our numbers is, are all that the people have to protect democracy. The real threats are not allowing people with a felony conviction to vote. The real threat is the fact that 12 billionaires are dominating our elections and buying our politicians because the Supreme Court and Citizens United allow them to flood 
mega donors to flood our elections and control our, the outcomes. So please, consider that. Thank you, Ms. Fetty. Mr. Duckers? Here's your 2020 census, which you just mentioned. I don't have the 2022 census. You mentioned 5.1 or almost 5.2 people, felons were denied the right to vote in the census. Just to be clear for this audience, 3 million of those people were either in prison or still compete, completing parole or felony probation or jail, correct? I believe that is it's correct. It's page 16 of your study, if you need it. Yeah. It is so correct. So some are in the community and some are in prison. Yeah, so two, uh, we're all, the topic here is whether after they've completed their sentence they should be allowed to vote. No one's advocating that they be allowed to vote in prison. Well, actually, I do advocate okay, that. Okay, well, that's fine. That's not our topic. So what we're talking about here is 2.2 million people in your 2020 sentence who had completed their sentences and were denied the right to vote, correct? That's what your, sense, your census shows. Who, some of whom were in the community, yes. Yeah, and we know from the DOJ statistics that within three years, 66% of them are going to have committed another crime, correct? And, and will once again have lost their right to vote. Well, if we actually brought them in the community, if we gave them the right to vote, Could they I? wouldn't recidivate at such high numbers. Yeah, well, let's answer my question, please. Two-thirds of the 2.2 million statistically are going to commit another fine, uh, felony and lose their right to vote which means we're talking not about five or six million people on this topic, we're talking at about 700,000 people, right? No, which I disagree with that. Which might swing an election in Florida for Al Gore, because I understand you're looking for votes there, <laughs> but it's uh, not No, a, it's I'm, not I'm looking for million. votes everywhere. I'm looking for votes for citizens. Mr. Ducker, your time They is deserve finished. the right to vote. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, affirmative. Okay. We will now hear from the negations first witness. Call Professor Stephen McAllister. Professor McAllister, thank you. Take have your seat. Here they are. Can you briefly describe for the audience your educational and professional background and qualifications to give opinion testimony on this topic? Um, <clears throat> I'm a double Jayhawk, including the KU Law School, um, clerked for two Supreme Court justices and have been working in the area of constitutional law for 30 plus years now, including numerous arguments at the Supreme Court and numerous articles and publications on constitutional law issues. Following mm -hmm. your graduation from KU Law School, could you identify for the audience all of the judges and justices that you clerked for? Judge Richard Posner in the Seventh Circuit in Chicago, Justice Byron White at the Supreme Court, and Justice Clarence Thomas at the Supreme Court. All right. And after you completed those clerkships, what did you do? I worked at a law firm known as Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher for one of the premier Supreme Court advocates, Ted Olson, who was later Solicitor General of the United States. All right. And then after that, did you come home and I came home to Kansas in 1993 and have been here ever since. Okay. And you've been at the law school ever since? Yes. <laughs> Were you the dean of the law school at one point? I was at one point for about five years. Do you have a... a particular chair that you occupy at the law school? I hold the ES and Tom W. Hampton chair. All right. Um, since you've been back in Kansas and at the law school, have you per performed any government service? I have. I served oh, for about 12 years as the Solicitor General of Kansas, working with the Attorney General's office. And then I served for more than three years as the United States Attorney for the District of Kansas. And when were you the U.S. Attorney? From 2018 to 2021. And that was a presidential appointment with Senate confirmation. All right. Um, and just briefly describe, because some of the audience may not know, what, what the, the job of the Solicitor General is in a state. Solicitor like General is basically the top appellate officer within the Attorney General's office. So I was working on constitutional appeals for the most part, either the Kansas Supreme Court or the U.S. Supreme Court. All right, sir. Um, the topic here is whether felons 
should receive their voting rights back upon completion of their sentence. What is the policy justification for denying the right to vote to felons who have completed their sentence? I mean, the historical and its long standing uh, has been sort of the Lockean theory that we have a social contract and people who've broken that contract by breaking the law should no longer be allowed to participate in the, the making of the law or even the selection of those who do the making of the law or the enforcing of the law, the prosecutors, the executive branch officials, or the adjudication of the law. You know, many judges are elected, so you often vote for judges as well. All right. Um, and from where does that policy, policy justification arise? You, you mentioned the Lockean theory, but if you could expand well, on it that. Well, it goes back to, in this country, easily to colonial times. Uh, and the first states to put it in their constitutions go back to at least the 1770s. Uh, there were a number of states that had this provision in their constitutions prior to the Civil War. This is not a Jim Crow development. Um, in fact, by the time of the 14th Amendment, which I can talk about, there were approximately 29 states that already had provisions barring felons from voting. So, and many of those states were southern states in which African Americans couldn't vote anyway, and also a lot of the northern states at that time did not allow African Americans to vote. So it was not targeted at African Americans. And to see if I follow that, there's, there would be no reason to use felon disenfranchisement to suppress the vote of a group of people who did not have the right to vote to begin with. No, no. Um, let's talk for a second about um, reconstruction, if you will. Could you describe for the audience what reconstruction is? So reconstruction was? is the era, the era post-Civil War in which we get the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. So the 13th Amendment comes first in 1865 which bans slavery. Uh, the 14th Amendment comes next in 1868, and it's famous for its first clause, which has the equal protection, due process provisions, but it has other clauses, and importantly here is the second section of the 14th Amendment, and the second section says states will actually lose representation if they discriminate against male voters over age 21, except they are allowed to do so if those voters participated in rebellion or have been convicted of other crimes. So the proponents and, and those who put forward the 14th Amendment recognized and approved of those state laws already in existence saying that felons could be denied the right to vote. And then the 15th Amendment guarantees equality of voting rights on the basis of race. So that package comes in close proximity. The 15th Amendment comes in 1870. So in about five years, you have these three amendments trying to rebuild after the Civil War. You have Union troops in the South enforcing a lot of things, including voting. So you had a lot of African-American participation actually in Southern states. Some of those post-Civil War statutes or constitutional changes adopting felon no voting rules were actually by some of those Reconstruction era Southern governments were, which were not yet really back under the control of white supremacists, if you will. Um, so there's really not uh, an indication at that stage that these laws were at all being used to suppress African American voting. Um, the other thing to remember is under the Constitution, Article 1, Section 2 says who gets to vote is determined by state law. There is no explicit right to vote in the U.S. Constitution. State constitutions usually have that. U.S. Constitution nowhere says you have the right to vote. It's implicit, and the Supreme Court has said it's fundamental, but it's not explicit anywhere in the Constitution, and states determine the qualifications of voters. All right. Um, now, I think you just testified that, that a, a majority, a vast majority of the states had felon disenfranchisement laws before the 14th Amendment was enacted. 14th Amendment expressly authorizes franchise 
uh, uh, felon disenfranchisement statutes, and there could be no reason for any of that to be racially targeted at any group, correct? No, and I, there, there may have been then later in the 19th century, certainly and even early 20th, there is a Supreme Court case called Hunter versus Underwood where the 1901 Alabama Constitution took it a step further and said we will also allow voters to be, or um, those convicted of misdemeanors, crimes of moral turpitude to lose the right to vote. So they went beyond felons and that was challenged as being applied in a way that was targeting particularly the poor and African American voters. And when that went to the Supreme Court, the court found that there was evidence that the motivation was racial discrimination. And so they struck down that law. But again, they distinguished the general felons lose the right to vote. And in fact, in 1974, upheld against constitutional challenge a California law that said felons lose the right to vote. And what was the name of that case? Um, that one's Richardson versus Ramirez. And could you describe, describe that for the audience? So please? that one in 1974, three felons had challenged losing their right to vote under California law and, the, and said it was a violation of equal protection. And the Supreme Court looked at the 14th Amendment and said, well, wait a minute, you can't just look at section one, which has got the equal protection clause, you also have to consider section two, which is simultaneous and acknowledges that states can have laws that um, disqualify felons from voting. And the court says, we don't see any evidence that when the 14th Amendment was proposed and ratified that they thought it would be unconstitutional to have such laws to the contrary they were basically acknowledging in section two that those laws were constitutional. And the court says, we don't see any reason to invalidate them today unless you can actually prove they are being used for discrimination purposes. All right. W would it be fair to summarize this, uh, Professor McAllister, by, by saying that the, the concept of felon disenfranchisement goes back to the formation of the country and is absolutely racially neutral. However, a, a handful, a very small handful, a few southern states in the, 18, nine, in, the, in the late 19th century sought to abuse the privilege of establishing those laws in a discriminatory fashion. Is that a pretty fair summary? That's a fair summary, okay. yes. And, and as um, my other expert colleague noted, I think today 48 states have such laws. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask you about one thing sort of related to Ms. Fedick's uh, testimony and, and her census here. I, I noticed here um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of talk from the other side about disproportionate impact, but it looks to me from looking at these statistics like four out of five felons are men. Were you aware of that? Yes. And, and is that because more men commit felonies or is it because disenfranchisement is focused on discriminating against men? No, it's, it's because more men commit felonies, more young people commit felonies than old people. I mean, you know, it's, it's really the criminal justice system. And as I listen to her testimony, I mean, it sounds like a lot of the complaints are with the system, but, you know, to have a constitutional equal protection claim, you've got to show intent to discriminate on a prohibited basis. And so just because you have an impact that is not a constitutional violation. That may be a policy argument, but again, the Constitution says it's up to the states to decide what the qualifications of the voters are, and if the states want to disqualify felons, they're entitled to do that under the Constitution. All right. Um, does a person, you've studied this as a scholar and you've been on the ground both as a U.S. attorney as well, but does a person convicted of a felony lose any other rights? They do. You mentioned several. I mean, often they will lose the right to serve on a jury or to hold public office. They will certainly lose their right, which is explicit in the Constitution under the Second Amendment, to possess <coughs> a firearm. Um, and there may be other consequences. They will also often be subject to a fine or restitution. Uh, and sometimes, you know, my experience as U.S. attorney, you may spend years trying to chase them collecting those monies uh, long after any prison sentence is served. 
All right. Um, with respect to these other non-monetary or prison term rights, are those the loss of those rights permanent, or do they get restored upon completion of the prison sentence? In your experience, they're typically permanent. Yeah. All right. Um, one one last question I want to ask you. Um, as U.S. Attorney, you're of course familiar with the, the sentencing procedure in federal court. During sentencing, are the victims of crime afforded an opportunity to speak to the court? Absolutely. Um, can, can, you, can you tell the audience here what that's like? Yeah, it can be very um, compelling. So under federal law, it's by statute. Under state law, it's often enshrined in state constitutions. Um, but victims have rights too. And so in a federal sentencing, often the victims, particularly if it's a violent crime, uh, will be allowed to come in and they may read a statement uh, at sentencing or they may actually even testify uh, with a prosecutor, an assistant United States attorney, asking them questions about their experience and what happened, uh, eliciting facts of the crime. But that is very much a part of a federal sentencing and it can be quite uh, compelling. I remember, I remember a couple of examples. We had a, a a homicide case, a second degree murder case where a woman had been killed um, by her romantic partner and I think maybe five of her family members, parents and sisters came in and all made statements about the effect that it had on them. Uh, we had a sexual abuse child pornography case where a young woman victim came in and testified about the experience she had had with the defendant and his efforts to groom her and eventually assaulting her and so you know the victims are allowed to come in and, and tell their story and express how this has affected them all right thank you professor mm -hmm. well that okay mr ergana gray mr mccallister you and i have known each other for many years haven't we yes we have in fact you and i have argued different sides of the issue in front of the supreme court haven't we yes we have you are a scholar of the Constitution, correct? I guess so. <laughs> well, you've, you, you know so, right? Yes. Uh, but you would also agree with me, would you not, that the Constitution, as it was written, had some significant flaws, correct? Absolutely. The framers decided that women were not qualified to vote, correct? Correct. The framers, knowing the abusive nature of slavery allowed slavery to continue, correct? They did. In fact, our African-American brothers and sisters were not even considered full human, were they? True. And it wasn't until 1928, with the passage of the 19th Amendment, that women were given the right to vote. Historically, that was just yesterday, wasn't it? True. So just because it is enshrined in the Constitution, that doesn't make it right, correct? That's true. Because we as a nation want to make a more perfect union, correct? Correct. And that more perfect union is one that should take into account improvements to society, correct? Certainly can, yes. Now, <clears throat> you would agree with me that it is not necessarily appropriate in an argument trying to decide an issue to simply rely on emotion, correct? True. It is important to consider facts, correct? Yes. So the fact that counsel may talk about this brutal attack on an individual that's left incapacitated, we all agree that's not good, right? We do. Right. But we also know that there is the young person, a student at KU, many of whom I've represented, that got arrested for possession of marijuana. And then a prosecutor, like you, charged them with possession with intent to sell because they had two ounces. And now they're a felon. And they've been de denied the right to vote. Does that seem right to you? Well, I think that's... No, does that seem right to you, yes or no? I think that's a choice a state can make under the Constitution. No, that wasn't my question. I wasn't talking about states' rights. 
Is that a choice that appears to be right to you, yes or no? Well, I'd have to think about it as a state legislator, I guess. But that's where it should be. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait. I'm asking you personally, not as a state legislator. Do you personally believe it is right to make a child a felon for possession of two ounces of marijuana? Probably not. Probably not. It is true, is it not, that the arguments you were referring to in favor of denying felons the right to vote largely depends or relies on a paper prepared by Roger Clegg, George Conway, and Kenneth Lee titled Free Speech and Election Laws. You're familiar with that document. I'm familiar with it, but I'd rely more on the um, Supreme Court case, the uh, Ramirez case. Well, but the Ramirez case simply stated that the 14th Amendment, Section 2, does allow, permissibly so, a state to deny a felon the right to vote. Right? And, and I would also rely on a case I didn't mention, the Second Circuit case, Green, written by Judge Friendly. A absolutely. But in those cases, the morality of the issue was not addressed. It was the permissibility of a state to do so, correct? Well, in Green, Judge Friendly talked about the sort of the Lockean theory of, you know, people not... But, but Locke was many, many decades ago. We're not talking today about Lockean philosophy as it applied back then. I mean, those are two different issues, correct? Well, I mean, you can still say we have a social contract and, we, and a felons may be forfeiting their right to participate. Do you believe, how much time do I have? 1120. 1120. I wish I had more time with you. <laughs> um, Me too. Yeah, I know. <laughs> this, is, this is fun. <laughs> Earlier, we were talking about the issue of not wanting felons to participate in our democratic process. You remember a council statement? Yes. Article 3 of the United States Constitution addresses the executive branch, correct? Actually, it's judiciary, but Article I, 2. I, 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 Article I, I, 2. Article 2. I beg your pardon. Article 3 is the judiciary. Article 2. Article 2 sets forth the qualifications for president. Correct. Correct? If the redhead <laughs> that Mr. Duckers was talking about is elected president after he's convicted as he should be, of felonies, the Constitution does not disallow him to take office, right? It doesn't, yeah. So the Constitution allows a convicted felon to become president, and yet you argue that a felon should not be allowed to vote? Doesn't that seem disingenuous to you, sir? It's ironic, yes. No further questions. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. McAllister. We'll now hear from the negation's second witness. And how much time does Mr. Duckers have left? 9.27. 9.27, perfect. 9.27, all right. Sorry to have used up some of your time, Professor Smith. Um, could you please describe your background and qualifications to opine, opine on the subject of felon disenfranchisement? Um, I'm a professor of political science at Emporia State University. I've published four books, and there's a fifth one in press. Two of those four books are about voting rights, and uh, I also testified as an expert witness for the plaintiff in the Bednosik v. Kobach case. Okay. Um, well, let's get right to the subject. Are you familiar with statistics on recidivism among felons? I'm generally familiar, yes. And could you describe for the audience what the data says 
about the, the, the incidence of recidivism among felons after they've completed their sentences? Uh, we're using Department of Justice uh, statistics. Um, roughly two-thirds of people convicted of felonies ca uh, can, are convicted of another offense within three years, and unfortunately, roughly three-quarters within five years. All right. Now, the topic that we're debating here is whether felons should, all felons, should automatically receive the right to vote after they've completed their prison sentence. Um, apparently that doesn't include paying fines or restitution or any of that, but just once they walk out of jail, they should be given the right to vote. How do those recidivism statistics bear on your thinking about that proposition? Automatic reenfranchisement. Well, even setting aside the emotional arguments, they create a real problem because if one uh, commits another offense for which one can lose voting rights, then these folks who had their voting rights restored will lose them again. Um, so even, again, not getting into the emotions associated with all this, um, it's, a, it's an administrative nightmare because you have people who have votes restored, uh, rights restored, uh, whether they choose to use them or not, and most don't, but we'll get into that later, um, and then it's taken away again. And so it's, uh, it's sort of a yo-yo sort of thing for that population. Now, again, you've got about a quarter who do not reoffend within five years. Okay. Are there any other problems, in your opinion, based on your study of criminology and voting rights with this notion that um, felons should automatically receive be reenfranchised after walking out the prison door. There's a huge problem, and that problem is that in states where they have that right restored, they don't take advantage of it. Um, so if I may give you an example, in the state of Iowa in 2020, Governor Kim Reynolds restored voting rights for about between 35 and 45,000 people who had been convicted of felonies earlier and completed their sentences. A year later, uh, according to an Iowa public radio study, fewer than 5,000 had registered and fewer than 3,200 actually voted in the next election. Now, if we look at three other states where one's voting rights are restored upon completion of the sentence, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and New York, there was a 2005 report uh, by the Sentencing Project, actually, that uh, I'd like to read you a quote from, if sure, I may. Sure. The quote is, Further, some recent reports have documented the lack of knowledge of felon pardon me, disenfranchisement laws among both persons with felony convictions and those who work with them, parole and corrections officers, social workers, including election officials in Ohio, Pennsylvania, and New York. And there are a few mechanisms in place upon completion of their period of disenfranchisement to inform persons who have lost their rights about what measures they must take to restore them and vote again. Much anecdotal evidence from these, those who work with this population has highlighted the level of misinformation that exists. So my point here is that many people in this situation, uh, no, most, are not even aware that their rights have been restored. And then I wanted to bring a couple of other things well, up, let, too. Let, let I, me, okay. let me ask wait. you one other question. Because, Go for it. you know, we each have our examples that we like to talk about here and to appeal to the sympathies of the emotion. I have my pistol-whipped liquor store owner, okay. and Mr. Aragona Gray has this poor KU student who was dumb enough to get busted for holding pot, which is <laughs> really hard to imagine that that could happen, but I guess it does. But those, prevent, those pre present very different circumstances when you're thinking about reenfranchisement, correct? Sure. All right. Sure. Is there is there a better way, a better approach than what they are advocating, which is to automatic? Well, they're advocating the automatic restoration of all felon of all voting rights after a felon completes his sentence. Although Ms. Fedig wants to wants to give voting rights to felons in prison, never take them away. But the proposition here is that they would receive voting rights absolutely, no questions, no exemptions like Mr. Volz has for murderers and sexual predators, but everybody gets it walking out of prison. Is there a better approach than that? 
I think so. Um, I believe passionately that people who have been convicted of felonies should be able to get their right to vote back. But again, like with the Iowa example and the uh, New York, Pennsylvania, and Ohio study, we know that even in states where they do, very few take advantage of that. And I wanted to bring up a couple of other things and Certainly. talk about Please this do. better way. Um, and that is that I'm concerned that many people in the criminal justice system do not have the skill set to be able to register and vote. So the uh, majority of people in the prison system we know did not graduate from high school. Um, I believe it's about 70 percent. Yes, it's about 70 percent did not graduate from high school. And there's one study of the Texas prison system that found that uh, approximately 48 percent of inmates in the Texas prison system are dyslexic. And it's uh, something that's being discussed more and more in the criminal justice community, the very high percentage of dyslexia among people who are in the system. And so I'm very concerned about the fact that simply automatically restoring this right doesn't mean people will take advantage of it. And we know that that's the case because of what happened in Iowa. So in terms of your better way, uh, I believe that there should be a pathway to restoration similar to the pathway of citizenship that some immigrants, some lucky immigrants, are offered to become American citizens. I believe that upon release from sentencing, including parole and probation, or even beginning during the sentence, um, that first of all, I think it's absolutely critical that there be a commitment that folks who did not graduate from high school, and that's most in the system, get their GEDs. And because many are dyslexic, that's going to require an IEP, an individual education plan, and state resources to be invested in that. And there are lots of benefits to that besides the right to vote, not to trivialize the right to vote. I believe that non-recidivism, to speak to something you've asked me about, should be a condition. One, one can't repeat offend, certainly repeat offend a felony. Um, now, ticky tack Let me just stop stuff. you right there a second. Yeah. And if, if we've talked about not restoring rights for people who may right. recidivize. Now right. you're talking about someone who is a recidivist, at right. least a two-time felon. What, what should the policy be with respect to people like that? That's a good question, and uh, one that would come up in the real world. I think that one would have to reset. So if someone was on my pathway, which would involve the completion of the GED, no reoffending, um, and uh, uh, other measures uh, to, to really prepare someone for citizenship, and they were to reoffend with a felony offense, not necessarily a speeding ticket or something, but a felony offense, it would, it would reset that, that right while they were serving sentence for the next offense, and that could be longer because they had priors. They, by the time they were done with that sentence, they would simply have to start the process over again. And that could push that back for many years for many people. I, I, I think you'd have to start the entire process over if you reoffended, starting with serving your sentence. All right. I interrupted you. Was there? We've got a few seconds left. Is there anything else you wanted to add before they? I just wanted to mention. There? There's a lot of talk about fairness with regards to crime victims, and I know that's a very real issue. But I'd also mention fairness with regards to naturalized U.S. citizens. When folks wish to become U.S. citizens, uh, it's not automatic. It's a path to citizenship. And I'm a strong supporter of that. And I think thinking about the history, the, the pre, pre-Jim Crow law history, where the loss of voting rights was not racialized, um, we can create a pathway back to full citizenship that includes the resources to be able to, to cast an informed vote to have the equivalent of a high school diploma, to receive civic education, uh, and to have the rights restored. That's Thank fine. you, Thank Professor. you, Mr. Smith. All right. Mr. Irigonagrai, and how much time does he have left for his cross-examination? Nine minutes, 45 seconds. I want a recount. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> um, Mr. Smith, I, I have just a few questions that I, I want to propose to you. Um, did I hear you say that you agree with the proposition that individuals convicted of a felon, felony after they have satisfied their sentence and paid their debt to society, they should be restored their right to vote, correct? 
Yes, you heard that correctly. You realize that that statement means we win. No, I don't realize that. That was it, the subject, and we are in the affirmative. So you agree with us, don't you? The subject is a blanket no, 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 restoration. Just listen. I get to ask the question. <laughs> you agree with the proposition that once a felon completes his sentence and takes care of post-release uh, terms, he or she should be reinstated the right to vote, correct? In many cases, yes. Okay. Now, you also know that to continue the status quo disproportionately harms African Americans. You know that, don't you? Yes, I do know that, including the You're, status quo in states that restore the right. You also, well, we're talking about the right to vote. Right. Okay, not other issues with discrimination, which are abhorrent. I agree. But we do know, we do know that the current status quo, the status quo disproportionately affects African Americans and poor people, correct? Yes, we do know that. And we also know, and you would agree, would you not, that the political analysis, the political calculus, as it were, is that to continue that status quo is of benefit to the Republican Party, correct? That's correct. So we know two things from you. Number one, or three things. Number one, felons after they complete their sentence and post-release supervision should be provided the right to vote. Secondly, that the current status quo disproportionately affects African Americans and people of color, correct? It should be provided the opportunity to earn the right to vote back. And the status quo... Let, 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 I was just asking mm -hmm. you, not about the process, but right. whether or not that's true. Disproportionately, they're more affected than other groups, correct? Yes, that's absolutely correct. And finally, you also agree that the status quo in denying African Americans disproportionately and poor people disproportionately the right to vote as a result of disenfranchisement benefits the Republican Party, correct? Yes, it does. You talked about the problem is not so much restoring the right to vote but the failure of those that have been restored to exercise the right, correct? And I would say the failure of the state. Have you done any type of research to consider what is the likelihood of a Republican-controlled legislature in the state of Kansas to spend the millions and millions and millions of millions of dollars to educate released felons about their right to vote? Have you advocated for that at the state legislature? I, I have not yet not advocated yet. for Is, that. Do I hear a promise from you that the moment you leave here, you're going to start advocating for the state of Kansas to spend millions and millions of dollars to help educate felons that are coming out of prison so they have a better chance to vote? I don't know how much money it would cost, but I do advocate that. Good for you. So now you've agreed with our proposition. You've agreed to spend millions of dollars of state's funds to do so. You're on our side. I think the question is how we get there. Do we do a blanket restoration or do we create a pathway? And if we don't create a blanket, a blanket approach, is it your suggestion then that we do it on a step-by-step -step basis? I think a step-by-step -step basis would be better than the status quo is. And what types of crime would you suggest should never be restored the right to vote? I appreciate your question. Treason, um, 
I think many voting related crimes, particularly trying to deny someone else's right to vote. Let me interrupt you there for a moment. So you would agree that interfering with the right to vote or efforts to suppress the right to vote should be a disqualifier for the right to vote. If it's a felony, yes. Do you believe that if the red-headed guy is convicted of a felony, a constitutional amendment should be passed to deny him the right to take office? Well, in principle, I don't think he should have the right to take office. I don't know about a constitutional amendment for one person, but I agree with the principle behind your question. Well, it wouldn't apply to just one person. The Constitution applies to us all, doesn't it? Of course, but so, sometimes laws are passed because of specific circumstances, and they're not good laws. Oh, I, I, I know that. <laughs> um, so you would uh, support a constitutional amendment to deny a convicted felon the right to sit in the Oval Office as President of the United States? I would word it more narrowly than that. I think someone who, say, had, had committed a nonviolent drug offense when they were young, no, I wouldn't take that right away from them. But for denying people their voting rights, which is the, some of the charges against former President Trump, that's what they are. Um, for that, yes. Good for you. See, we agree on a lot of things. We do. Yeah. I disagree on a few. Well, not that many, and I accept that you may be wrong. Um, and I you. <laughs> so, um, as the status quo is right now, just to conclude, the status quo benefits the Republican Party, correct? Correct, including in states that supposedly restore the right. And for that reason, and because of the disproportionate impact on African Americans and the poor, we need to change the, the law to allow restoration of the right to vote to millions of Americans that at the moment are being denied by a system which is fair, correct? You're saying the current system is fair? No, no. By a system oh, which will be... Oh, we need a be, system is fair. Yes. Yes, we need to do it the right way. The right way. Okay. You do know that there are states in the union that allow felons while in prison to vote? Maine and Vermont. And to your knowledge, have those states suffer any disadvantage as a consequence of that process? No, those are smaller states with a pretty small percentage of people in the criminal well, but, justice but wait, system. But wait a minute, but we're talking... We, we, they may we, not be representative of larger I, states. I, I understand. Yeah. But the states that have allowed felons to vote, even while incarcerated, have not seen any adverse effect from that particular process, correct? I don't know. I haven't studied that. You just said that the answer was no. I don't know of any. Okay. You also know of foreign countries that never remove the right to vote as a consequence of a felony conviction, correct? I am aware of that. Have you ever done any studies to ascertain whether or not those nations are experiencing any type of adverse consequence as a result? Uh, no, most of my research compares U.S. states to each other. So, in fact, as you sit here today testifying, you have absolutely not a shred of evidence, one way or the other, to discuss whether or not states and nations that allow vote, excuse me, that allow felons to vote even while incarcerated suffer any adverse consequences. You just simply Your don't know. Your time is know. finished, Mr. Yagonagarai. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. You may be seated now. Okay. All right. We will now begin our closing arguments with Mr. Duckers. I'll give you a minute to sit down. I'll, I'll let him. Put that time back. Keep it fair. Keep it fair. <laughs> so we've heard a lot of emotional appeals here about the 
rights of felons and how unjust it is to deprive them of their right to vote. And Professor McAllister referred to the Green decision by Judge Friendly, who's one of the most renowned jurists of recent history in 1964. And I just want to read to you what, what Judge Friendly had to say, because it's not based in the Constitution. It's based in morality and common sense. He writes in upholding New York's law disenfranchising felons, quote, on a less theoretical plane, it can scarcely be deemed unreasonable for a state to decide that perpetrators of serious crimes shall not take part in electing the legislators who make the laws, the executives who enforce these, the prosecutors who must try them for further violations, or the judges who are to consider their cases. This is especially so when account is taken of the heavy incidents of recidivism and the prevalence of organized crime. A contention that the Equal Protection Clause requires New York to allow convicted felons to vote for district attorneys or judges would not only be without merit, but as obviously so as anything can be. It makes no sense under our social contract to allow those who break the laws to continue to make the laws. Now, you've heard a lot here about uh, dis disparate impact. I mean, men are disparately impacted by felon disenfranchisement. So are young people. So as it turns out, are Afri African-American people. That's a function of who commits crime, not of the system. It's a shameless hunt for Democratic votes, which we're going to talk about in just a little bit. But we're going to set all of this noise aside because at the end of the day, when you are asked to decide this question, it's a very simple question. Is, de is permanently denying the right to vote to felons a punishment that is just too harsh? We're going to send the felon to prison. We're going to require restitution. We're going to strip him of his opportunity to hold office. We're going to take away his guns. But in your mind, is it simply a step too far to say, that for your trans transgressions against society, you must also forfeit your right to further participate in our representative democracy. That is the only question that is before you today. And on the other side, they would say, absolutely, as soon as you're out of prison, boom, you get your right to vote back. We have a better approach, wh which we outlined for you. But the answer to that question is probably determined by where your sympathies lie. If your sympathies lie with the criminals, then you will say that punishment is too harsh. If your sympathies lie with the victims, and by victims I mean not just the individual victims, but all of us in society, then you must say that punishment is not too harsh. But here's one thing I can guarantee you, absolutely guarantee you. For every single person in this room, including the people at that table, there is some person or some crime or some combination of person and crime in which you would say, no, sir, you have forfeited your right to further participate in our representative democracy, and your vote will not be restored. And we know that from Mr. Volz, who actually wrote the statute supposedly restoring felon rights, but he said no to murderers and no to violent sexual criminals. But for all of us, there is someone where you would say, that's too much. And maybe it's Donald Trump, maybe it's Harvey Weinstein, maybe it's Timothy McVeigh's accomplice, but there is someone for whom you, will, you would not say disenfranchisement is too harsh a punishment. But I want to ask you to do one thing before you answer that question in your own mind. Do one thing. Go down to the Superior Court. Go to, go to the Federal District Court on sentencing day and listen to the testimony and comments of the victims of crime. Hear their pain, their searing anguish, their sorrow, that's not going to go away when the perpetrator finishes his prison sentence. That's there for a lifetime. Go and listen to them and then decide whether saying to someone, no, sir, no, sir, you have forfeited your right to participate in our representative democracy. You decide then whether that's too unreasonable. I mean, the simple fact of the matter, it's easy to pull on your heartstrings, but blanket felon, felon disenfranchisement is just like Roy Regal in the 1929 Rose Bowl game. They are running the wrong way with the ball. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Duckers. Mr. Rigonagarai? Thank you. I disagree. 
this is not about victims' rights. This is not about defendants' rights. This is not about who's suffering more, who's suffering less. This is about society. This is about what we can do together to improve our society. The status quo is not working. What can we do? Is it wise to incorporate people that have violated the law and have completed their sentence and post-release supervision to reintegrate, to become part of us, the American experiment? I believe the answer is yes. If for no other reason that they have paid their debt. Imagine if you went to the bank and you borrowed $100 and the interest payment never stops. Never stops. Enough is enough. There are benefits to reintegration. Benefits to reintegration that could not be denied. A very good friend of mine, his two parents were brutally murdered. His name is Bill Lucero. He heads the Kansas Anti-Death Penalty Group. Because what he did was, he took the anger, the pain, involved with the brutal murder of his parents and asked, should I continue this? Should I make myself one of those that wish to kill to teach others that killing is not right? And he's one of the nation's leading advocates to abolish the death penalty. So, having practiced law for 50 years, both as a special prosecutor with the Attorney General's office and as a defense lawyer, I know the pain from both sides. I have had many people crying on my shoulders. But I can tell you this, it is to our advantage to reintegrate those that have committed crime. There's no better example than Neil. He's a prior felon. Look what he's done, not only for himself, but for society. And what did he say about the right to vote? How it made him feel? the value added to the quality of life. These people are amongst us. They're in our society. Bring them into the tent. I can see why the Republicans don't want to do it. But this is not a Republican or a Democratic issue. Again, this is a societal issue. This is for our benefit like decriminalizing the stupidity of some drug laws. And by the way, counsel said that my student from KU had to be stupid to be broken. Like every student in this campus, he was brilliant. There. <laughs> so, I urge you to think about it. I urge you to read the literature, to read the studies from Ms. Fedig's organization, to read studies presented by Neil. And finally, I want to thank my good friend, Stephen McAllister, and Mr. Smith, whom I had not met previously, and of course, my dear friend, Ed, for being such a gracious, intelligent, and valid opponent. Thank you. All right, let's give a round of applause.
Thank you so much to our amazing counselors and to our um, wonderful expert guests tonight for joining us. <laughs> I hope you all enjoyed this program, and we thank you for joining us this evening, especially in light of the uh, rainstorm out there. Please join us for our next Dole Institute program. As a reminder, next Tuesday, November 15th at 2 p.m., as we will hear author Erica Cornelius Smith discuss her book, Service Above Self, Women Veterans in American Politics, which will tell stories of women who, are, who served in or adjacent to the US military and then transitioned into a life in public service. We hope to see you there. Thank you again for attending tonight's program and have a great night. Thank you.